Three years ago, U.S. President Barack Obama announced the Power Africa Initiative to double access to power in sub-Saharan Africa. More than two-thirds of the population of sub-Saharan Africa is without electricity, and more than 85% of those living in rural areas lack access. The Electrify Africa Act was passed by both chambers of the U.S. Congress after nearly two years. And joining me in the studio is Martin Lowry, Senior Vice President for External Affairs and Member Relations at the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, NRECA. Martin, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you so much, Esther. It's you, a you real know, pleasure I'm, to be here. Sure. I, I'm looking at this, which is quite an ambitious program. When you think about 85% of the population in rural sub-Saharan Africa without power, can this really be achieved? 550 million to 600 million people by estimates. Um, I think that's one of the important aspects of why it took two years for the Electrify Africa Act to be completed by the Congress because there were a lot of issues that were discussed around can this possibly be done. Uh, we felt strongly through the whole uh, advocacy process that you had to begin with the principle that access to electricity is a fundamental right of a human being and you've got to figure out a way to do it. I would say collaborative approaches are the only way we'll achieve it. And, and when you look at, at Africa, of course, there is no doubt there is uh, enormous potential with all these vast uh, new found and discovered uh, reserves of oil right. and gas. Right. And, but what really needs to be done to make use of this potential? That's a very tough question and one that, politically speaking, was one that was debated uh, for the two years. Do you look at only a renewable energy strategy or do you have to look at, at fossil resources as well, like oil and gas? Um, the argument that won the day was you've got to look at an all-of-the-above strategy. If you don't do that, you'll be leaving people behind for years and years. The other piece of it, though, is you need pipeline for natural gas, and the whole pipeline infrastructure issue will require some innovative approaches for what we would call off-grid technology. And again, when you look at the Electrify Africa Act, it's, it's been called a life-changing mm -hmm. legislation. Mm -hmm. Can you simplify that for us? Well, first of all, I would like to compliment the authors on both sides of the aisle because this was a huge bipartisan success in a period of time when we mostly have gridlock. So we've got Senator Cardin from, from Maryland, Senator Corker from Tennessee. You've got uh, Representative Royce from California and Representative Engel from New York. Those are the heroes of this story, and they fought hard to make sure that the whole principle here of access to electricity and the consequences of that for health, education, girls' education in particular, um, can be seen as absolutely essential to the globe. You know, many people are looking forward to this. I grew up in a country where I didn't have electricity. I had mm -hmm. to use a lantern sometimes to do my homework. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, since the Electrify Africa Act was, you know, passed, have you been on the ground yet? Which countries have you started working on and maybe what are the challenges so far? Yes, and I would say that the work we've been doing recently was inspired by the Electrify Africa Act. We're only at the beginning stage of looking at the collaborative approaches. But for example, we're working in Ethiopia right now with the government on a national electrification strategy. We're doing the same in your home country of Kenya. <laughs> we're working with Uganda specifically on a rural electrification strategy. We're working in Liberia with an off-grid approach to solar energy and then combining that with a question of where you already had diesel uh, available, diesel oil for generation, how would you bring in solar to be able to offset the need to run that diesel 24-7? The major projects going on right now. So when you look at uh, some of the countries, sometimes what you run into is uh, bureaucratic tape. Yes. And uh, I'm wondering whether you've run into that yet and how you deal with that. We run into that all the time, and it's not just a situation for the continent of Africa. <laughs> we've, we've been at this business since 1962 on a not-for-profit basis, and everywhere in the world you have to worry about the role of the national government in relationship to people having control of their own destiny. So we constantly work toward the kind of national legislation which ensures that the government does not control the outcome, that it's a public-private partnership just as it occurred in the United States. Tell me a little about uh, how the electric, electric cooperatives work, uh, you mm -hmm. know, to be able to get electric to people, especially in remote areas of, of the continent. Well, it, it replicates what was done in the United States going back to 1935, which is that the local people 
if it's a cooperative, and you can't always do that, so there's a, there's a caveat on that. It, it, it depends on the national enabling legislation. But suppose that enabling legislation allows for a true cooperative. That means the local people who are basically providing themselves the service of electricity own, own the organization. They maintain the system. They operate the system. And the, the money that you pay on your electric bill is credited to you as a member owner. So there's basically patronage capital. Your patronage of the cooperative uh, builds over time, and most cooperative boards of directors, locally governed boards of directors, will on an annual basis return a certain amount of that retained earnings to the, to the consumer. Martin, I wish we had more time to look at the technology and how this can work with uh, electrifying the rural areas of the continent of Africa. But thank you so much for coming on to Africa 54. Thank you. Martin Lowry is Senior Vice President for External Affairs and Member Relations at the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, NRECA.